so that we can hear the word that Mikado have for us and that we can accept the word that uh, you're giving to us. Lord, we ask that you speak through Mikado and that you give him all the words that uh, he needs. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You bet. Thank you, sir. Got a couple of new ones on here. For, and for you new guys, we, we host a monthly uh, Zoom call. Uh, the last Thursday of each month, and we use current coaches, uh, retired coaches, and those uh, outside the coaching arena that have a heart for coaches. Those are the people that we use as speakers. Mikado is our third one. As we started this and we started lining speakers up, well, we, uh, his name obviously is on top of that list. So I think you'll really enjoy him this morning. Our theme this year is unity, and the calls last for about 30, 35 minutes. We try and give our speaker as much time as possible, but this is an excellent opportunity for us to network and encourage each other uh, in the word from various locations. Uh, today, we have coaches from uh, Kansas City, from the Wichita area, uh, from Dallas, uh, all on the call this morning. We expect a few more. Uh, our speaker will close us out with a word of prayer. And then in the coming days, uh, either Chris Dyer, Mike Breeden, or myself will make contact with you guys and uh, share some more information about Coaches Outreach with you and to tell you how it can help you personally and how it will help you and your staff. So, to give our speaker all the time he needs, uh, I want to say just a few words about him. You saw the bio when we sent out the the invite of where he's worked. Uh, I met Mikado in the late 90s, I believe. Uh, he's from the Kansas City area. I know his parents. He was a good friend to my youngest sister and her family while he was here. So uh, that's how we were introduced. And then we worked together with FCA uh, and for several years. Uh, his ministry took him to uh, Houston. Now he is at Texas A&M. Uh, but enough about all that. <clears throat> what I'm most Im uh, impressed with when it comes to Mikado, you will never meet a more humble guy than Mikado Henson. He comes from good stock. The apple don't fall far from the tree. Uh, but an incredible young man, and he's made an impact on coaches and athletes uh, everywhere. If you saw the picture on the invite, a picture is worth a thousand words. And if you saw that picture, that's Mikado Henson, and uh, that's what he brings to the table. So we're real excited and honored that you would uh, share an early morning with us, my brother. And uh, we'll give you the rest of the time, and, and uh, we'll take it from there. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well today. I told my wife I had an early um, coach's huddle that I was speaking to, and she said, how'd that get set up? I said, Uncle Milty. I said, Milt Cooper. I said, how can you tell Milt Cooper no? You don't tell Milt Cooper no. And so, um, well, I just want to say that it's an honor to be with you all today. Uh, I'm honored and humbled that you would jump on uh, the Zoom. I hope that um, this ministry that you're a part of has been a blessing to your life. Hope, hopefully it's been an encouragement to your life. And especially during a lot of these times of um, this distancing and a lot of churches not meeting and things like that, um, I hope, I don't want to say supplement, but I hope that this is added to um, your spiritual growth. And so, um, again, I'm honored and humbled to be here. And, and I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the man in the top left corner of my screen, that is Milton Cooper. I remember sitting with him. I was a student in Norfolk State University in Norfolk, Virginia, thinking that I was going to be a world-famous broadcaster and um, started feeling a tug on my heart uh, outside of the broadcast booth into ministry. And it necessarily wasn't pulpit ministry, but it was ministry. Um, how do I marry my love for sports with my love for the Lord? And I was introduced to FCA and then offered an opportunity uh, to join the FCA team uh, in Houston, Texas. 
And so my wife, my nine month old at the time is now 23. Um, we packed up a U-Haul truck, uh, and, and drove from Norfolk, Virginia, all the way to Houston, Texas, and, um, started in the inner city of Houston. And some of my, my teeth were cut in ministry there. And some of my dearest, my most fond memories of ministry, uh, were there. And so, uh, I'm forever indebted to Milton Cooper. I tell the story of, of, uh, how Milton and I talked in his office and Carrie Casey and, uh, just some of those, um, amazing people. I grew up in Olathe, Kansas. Um, and as Texans would say, I got to Texas as quickly as I could, but, uh, yeah, my parents are still in Olathe. Uh, they, they'll be married 50 years, uh, this June and, um, I'm biracial. My dad's black. My mom is white. And uh, so they got married in 1971 when there was a big frown on faces uh, with interracial marriages. Um, I usually say, and I guess I'll go ahead with you guys, there's usually not a huge smile now, but um, a little bit more accepted, you know. And I, I just want to say it's beautiful to see a sea of faces uh, here as well. I believe this is what heaven is going to look like. So as we learn to worship together on earth, we're just literally doing a little precursor uh, to what we're going to be doing for eternity. And so that is really, uh, really blesses my heart. You know, I hear all the time that, you know, I'm going into my 22nd college football season as a chaplain or director of player development. If you're into titles, I mean, I, whatever that means, um, my 23rd year of ministry and people always say Mikado, you've made it big time, man. You're in the SEC. You're working at Texas A&M. I'm going in my eighth season at A&M, and they're like, man, you guys are doing big things, blah, blah, blah. And it always kind of, um, it always kind of confuses me be, uh, in ministry. I hear ministry people say that. And I, it confuses me because I'm like, well, what makes a place, make, what makes something big time? What makes um, where you are big time? Is it the conference? Is it the size of the stadium? Is it the prestige of the uh, school or ministry or university that you're working at? I mean, I, yes, I may be a little further along from the $24,000 a year that I started with, with FCA, that I probably could have negotiated to 30, but I was so happy just to take a job. They offered 22. I said, I was hoping 24. They said, great, really fast. And so, uh, <laughs> but... I remember, and let me go backwards just a little bit, guys. I remember standing in Johnston Middle School in HISD with Coach Johnny Simmons. And I remember the talks we would have about the Word of God and the time, the interactions that he would stop his gym class and say, can you talk to my class right now? Give him a word. I mean, you know, um, I remember him saying, now you can't leave without praying for my kids now. But we can't close our eyes because i got to keep my eye on them. <laughs> I said, we'll just act like we're talking because that's what we're doing. And uh, I remember um, going to speak every Friday at Madison, Houston Madison High School, um, where there was a young high school face looking at me in this hot trailer as my chin's dripping with sweat uh, named Vince Young. And uh, Courtney Lewis, who was a very good running back here at A&M, and I remember being in this packed trailer sharing the word of God with these men before they go get on the yellow bus and go to Del Mar Stadium and play a game in HISD. Now, that's big time to me. The big time, as Frosty Westering said, is where you be, make the big time where you are. And that's, and I just say that as a, I want to honor you all who are in ministry, those who are coaching. Um, right where you are, smack dab in the middle of where you are uh, with the group of young people that you have, uh, the people that you're leading, that's big time. That's where the big time is. And so I've been fortunate. I was at the University of Houston for 14 seasons with four head coaches. Uh, some may be familiar names, Dana Demmel, Art Bryles, Kevin Sumlin, two years with Tony Levine, and then I moved to A&M, was with Kevin and now going into my third season with Jimbo Fisher. And so, um, but the mission hadn't changed, y'all. The titles may change. The scenery may change. The salary may change. 
the mission doesn't change. And that is to shine bright, to make him, his name known. And, um, and, and he's still saving people and he's still discipling and, and people are still growing, uh, in the Lord. And that's the mission. So location may change, but the mission stays the same. And so, um, to be united in Christ, to be his follower, to identify with him is, uh, what's big time. And so, uh, yes, we've been stamped y'all and we all wear different colors, but it was all the same color of blood that saved us at the foot of that cross. And so, um, I am uh, humbled to be recognized as his. I want to share a story with you. I remember driving back from Kansas City with my family uh, back to Houston in 2013. Um, it was the Christmas season. We normally like to drive through the night. I drive through the night. Um, I got my landmarks, you know, leaving Olathe, hitting Wichita, uh, getting on I-35, uh, I-45 just outside of that going through beautiful Ardmore, Oklahoma, Milt, um, Kevin. Uh, so I remember uh, driving through. My family's asleep, and my music's playing, and it's me, the highway, the Lord, and some sunflower seeds. And I remember asking God. I remember literally asking God. This wasn't one of those pr heart, uh, prayers from my heart. It was from my heart to my lips to his ears. And I remember saying, Lord, what do you want for my life? in 2014 and I was expecting uh, James Earl Jones's voice to speak back to me <laughs> as I'm driving down I-35 I honestly think it was near the Ardmore area maybe Purcell or I don't know it was one of those um, er big cross that's on the side of the highway there it must have been that time because I was having a moment with the Lord but I'm driving down I-35 south and I mean, I-45, and um, I guess 45 hits. I was still on 35 in Oklahoma. <clears throat> and I didn't hear an audible voice, but I heard a voice very clearly. And this is the word I want to encourage you all with today. I didn't hear a deep theological three-point message of God's marching orders for my life. But going into that new year, I heard as clear as day, Mikado, all I want you to do this year is trust me. And I'm leaning in as I'm driving. My thought process is, huh? Like, what does that look like? When I got back to Houston, I started praying into that, and I started studying into that because I wanted to know more because I felt like it was Trust me, dot, dot, dot. And I was wanting more. But the marching orders were just trust me. You're mine. You're one in me. Trust me. I got you. And so I started digging into the scriptures. And when you think of trust, if you're taking notes, what is oftentimes the first thing, the first scripture that comes to mind when we think of trust? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 which is you, you push me against the wall and I come out swinging with the scripture, that's going to be my one that I'll hang my hat on. Trust, it's a great promise. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and here's the promise, he will direct your path. But me being a hardhead or maybe borderline cynic, I'm like, I need more. Right? Anybody ever said that? All right, God, I hear what you're saying, but can you can you can you make it a little more clear for a brother? You know, I'm I'm hard headed, and I'm not too smart. And so I I love just um, combing through the gospels, and if I'm leaning in like this, it's because I'm I do a lot of Zoom recruit recruiting and stuff like that, and I'm, I I get known by uh, some of my coworkers are saying, man, you get all fired up and you start leaning in the camera like that. Moms and dads get scared. So I'm uh, maybe leaning in a little bit, but I started coming through the Gospels. And, and here's where I want to take us for the next few minutes. I'm looking at my time. As I was driving down the highway that night and I heard the voice of the Lord clearly in my heart, in my spirit, tell me all I want you to do is trust me. I didn't know uh, what was on the horizon for me and my family. 
All I knew is that we were in a situation that we were serving God, okay? The ministry in Houston was going really, really well um, with FCA, uh, in our church, all those things. It was, it was going great. We weren't asking to be rescued anywhere, but God still said, all I want you to do is trust me. And those who I've been in, I was a nonprofit for a long time. Sometimes I get those letters called red zone letters and my trust levels will go really through the roof saying, how much do I have on my account? I'm about to go on unpaid leave. Okay, Lord, I trust you. And he would always provide. Uh, but as I, I was looking through the gospels and I, and I came upon a, a narrative, that, something that happened in the scriptures that I want to talk to you about uh, this morning. And I hope for the next few minutes, these few points, would encourage you as they encouraged me then, and they are still encouraging me to this day, okay? And it's found in Matthew chapter 14. For our time's sake, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll kind of set it up, uh, what's going on. But it's Matthew 14, starting in verse 22. So what's just happened in the scriptures is John the Baptist was just beheaded, okay? And, and you think about, remember, John the Baptist, the one who baptized Jesus, um, a relative of Jesus, you would think Jesus being fully God, fully man, and one of your relatives. I just had two relatives die a week apart, February 15th and the 22nd, and my heart was grieved. Um, I grieved pretty quickly, but it was grieved nonetheless. And you would think Jesus, fully man, was probably in a period of grieving. Okay, just on the heels of that, uh, the disciples brought a little boy with a fish, the fish and the bread, and all the people that were there. And Jesus performed the miracle, feeding the 5,000 plus, right? Um, so even in the midst of his grieving, people were still pulling from him. Well, then you get to Matthew 14, starting in verse 22. And remember, we're talking as, as believers, all God wants us to do is trust him. And so what happens is, is he makes the disciples get into the boat and go to the other side of the lake. Just a little sidebar, you, it would be like asking a group of coaches, okay, I want you to go into your coaching office and wait for me there. You're in your environment, you're in your element, and it's a pretty safe space for you. And that's what it would be to most of these disciples, not all of them, but most of them were fishermen. And so... Uh, they were pretty comfortable on the water. And so here's what, here's what it says here. Uh, after dismissing the crowds, Jesus went up onto a mountainside by himself to pray. Well into the night, he was there alone, but the boat was already of distance from the land, and there was a great storm. The boat was being battered by the waves. The wind was beating against them. And then in the middle of the night, Jesus came walking to them on the water as if that weren't enough, right? Um, so as he was walking out into the waters, the disciples saw him. They, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said. And Peter said, Lord, he said, have courage. It's me. Don't be afraid. Peter speaks up. Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. After climbing out of the boat, Okay, that's a crazy statement right there. Peter began to walk on the water toward Jesus. But then it says, but when he saw the strength of the wind and the waves, he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. And then the word immediately, Jesus reaches out immediately. How long would it take Peter to fall through water? Pretty quick, right? Immediately, Jesus grabs him and walks him back to the boat. You know, why did you doubt me? You have little faith. <clears throat> they were amazed. But I just want to talk to you guys, pull a few points from this narrative as I heard the Lord speaking clearly to me on the highway that night, driving from Kansas City back to Houston, Texas. In Mikado, all I want you to do is trust me. Point number one, here's what we can learn from that. Jesus made prayer a high priority. In the midst of everything that was going on, Jesus dismissed the crowds, and he went into the mountainside, up to the mountains by himself to pray. If, if Jesus, being fully God, had to connect with the Father, how much more ought we? Our communion 
with A.W. Tozer said, I mean, I don't want to butcher this, talking to men about God is a great thing, but talking to God about men is greater still. Leonard Ravenhill said, no man is greater than his prayer life. The pulpit can be used as a shop window to display man's gifts, but the prayer closet allows no room for showing off. You didn't think you'd get punched in the face by Leonard Ravenhill this morning, did you? Well, I just did, so I figured let him, let him throw one on you as well. Um, Mark 135 and said, while it was still early, while it was still dark, Jesus got up and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. You think about this, that was on the heels of Jesus healing Peter's mother-in-law. And the whole town gathered at the door, Mark chapter 1, if you want to read it. But early in the morning, Jesus got up. He didn't, like me, hit snooze uh, a couple of times. He got up early in the morning. And when his disciples found him, what did they find him doing? He was the living example. He was praying. He was connecting with the Father. Jesus made prayer a high priority, man. And we ought to as well. If, if we're going to uh, answer uh, the statement, more or less, all I want you to do is trust me. Well, the only, reason, the only way that I'm going to know what you're doing is if I connect with you. Jesus made prayer a high priority, and so should we. Also, if you want to look for just for a reference, John 17, you talk about a prayer of unity, Jesus' high priestly prayer. He prays for three groups in that prayer. He prays for um, himself. He prays for his disciples. And he prays for all other believers, Lord, that you'd make them one as we are one. So John 17, just as a side note. So not only do we make, Jesus made prayer a high priority, we ought to as well. Point number two, regardless of what you're currently going through, Jesus doesn't always run to our rescue. It says he came to them walking on the water. If you think you're going to drown and all these other things, hurry up. Have you ever thought that before? When you're asking the Lord and seeking the Lord for something, Lord, I wish you would hurry up. But I want to encourage you with three sub points in this. Although he doesn't always run to our rescue, he sees what you're going through. He knows what you're going through intimately. And here's the comforting thing. He cares. He sees, he knows, and he cares, but he doesn't always run to our rescue. And they were in trouble. They were in trouble. And he came to them walking on the water. So Jesus made prayer a high priority. He may not always run to our rescue, but he sees, he knows, and he cares. Point number three, following Jesus will always call us to a deeper level of trust. All the disciples didn't ask Jesus, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come. Peter did. Peter was being drawn to a deeper level of trust. If you are who you say you are, I'm going to join you on the water. I'm going to leave what is quote-unquote comfortable to join you where you are. And Jesus made the call, and he said, come. Now, Peter had a choice to make. Oftentimes, Peter would make the wrong choice or the, in, the impulse choice, right? I identify with this cat. I really do. There's times where I'll impulsively say something, and 20 minutes later, I'm apologizing to my wife. Amen? Uh, or I will do something like, gosh, dog it, Mikado. You shouldn't have, oh, so to speak, what are you doing? You know, I'm kind of like that. Someone walks up on one of my leaders, I'm slicing off ears. I'm that type of cat. Okay, just me. I don't know if it's the hints and blood, still my sinful nature, I, or my loyalty. I don't know if it's a positive or it's a negative. I'm not sure yet, but I have a spirit of an armor bearer. And if you walk up on someone who's leading, whether it's my head coach or my pastor, and you you have issues, you do have issues instantly. That's just the kind of guy, kind of guy I am. So, but anyway, Jesus, I digress. Jesus will always call us to a deeper level of trust. 
And here's the beautiful thing about Jesus, and this is what frustrates me sometimes about Jesus. Is that okay to say? He will call us to a deeper level of trust, but he's under no obligation to explain to us why. He doesn't owe us an explanation. He's calling us to obedience. He's calling us to trust him. And if he says, come, and we say, ah, now we're leaning into disobedience. We say in our house, slow obey is no obey. Son, take out the trash. I will. Son, take out the trash. I will. No, no, you didn't get it. Right now, get up. Slow obey is no obey. Get up right now and take out the trash. Oh, you know, young teenager. Okay, what, what can I do when I get done with this game? I've heard that before. Maybe some of you have as well. Some of the older cats, your kids were playing Nintendo uh, when they were saying that, right? Uh, that's what I was doing. But Jesus is no under, under no obligation, but he calls us to a deeper level of trust. So he, he made prayer a high priority. So should we. He doesn't come running to our situations, but he sees and he knows and he cares. He calls us to a deeper level of trust. Come. Can you give me some more details? You want me to climb over the side of this boat and join you on something that doesn't naturally hold people. Yes, come. All right. And as long as Peter kept his eyes on Jesus, point number four, when our lives are committed to him, when our, our lives are aligned to him, when, our, when, when we are completely focused for living, in the, living for Jesus in the sphere of influence that he's called us, in the community that he's called us. When we focus on him, there's nothing that we can't do. Peter defied the natural and operated in the supernatural. And that's not to get weird and spooky. But he literally had his eyes locked in on the Lord. You know how you are. I know how I am. When I am fully in tune with God, don't you feel like you're hearing him clearly? But whether it's sin or just blatant disobedience, don't you feel it's kind of cloudy sometimes? It's like trying to turn that radio dial and I can kind of hear it. And it's kind of fuzzy. Sometimes you're like, I'm not hearing the Lord clearly. But when we're locked in on him, walking on water was done. Makata, all I want you to do is trust me. <clears throat> So you look in verse 29 and 30, he walked, as he kept his eyes locked on Jesus, he walked on water. But when he saw the strength of the wind and the waves, he began to sink. It's when we take our eyes off Jesus that we begin to sink. Yes, we're still his child. Yes, we, he still identifies with us and he calls us righteous. But let's just truth be told, when we take our eyes off the Lord, we sink. When we take our eyes off the Lord, we can't fully walk in what he's told us to trust him to do. And all he said is, all I want you to do is trust me. And I remember it was February of 2014 that I got a call from Kevin Sumlin. After two years of offering me a position at A&M and praying about it and turning it down to stay in Houston, I heard God say, it's time. And we packed up our belongings, and we, I, 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 I um, accepted the position without even talking salary because I knew God said, trust me. And it has been the best move for my family and I. It has been the best move. We still have dear friends in Houston. Obviously, we're right down the road. My wife was in Houston last, last weekend. Uh, for my pastor, my old my ex, my pastor's uh, daughter's baby shower. That's how close we're still there. But God said, "Trust me." And then when I got that phone call to say I'm going to join you at Texas A&M, I had no idea that it would lead up to moments like this. Sitting here on Zoom at 6:34 in the morning with a group of amazing men talking about the Word of God. See how God's perfect plan aligns. Henry Blackaby said this in Experiencing God. Uh, God has a will for our life, and we must make major adjustments in our life to align with his will. 
oftentimes we ask God to align to our will. <laughs> How does that work out for us, right? But we have to make the major adjustments. And I could have been hard-headed and said, things are going great in Houston. Why would we want to leave? Man, we love our church. I was an associate pastor there. Um, we were serving with FCA. I was a chaplain at the University of Houston. I was stepping in from time to time as a chaplain for the Houston Rockets. And all these amazing things are going on. But God said, all I want you to do is trust me. And I had no idea of what he wanted to do in me, to me, and through me. The last part is really humbling because I know me. <laughs> That'll preach. <laughs> that literally is not on notes. I just can't. I, no one asked me to repeat it. I don't know if I could. Uh, but God has shown himself so faithful, man. And But you know where it started? Fellowshipping with, with, with amazing people just like you. I believe one of the greatest callings in life is when you say, yes, I'll coach other people's children helping shape and mold leaders of our next generation whilst playing tug of war with the world. It's pretty tough. But sometimes God will say, all I want you to do right now is trust me. This kid's never going to get it. All I want you to do is trust me. Oh, man, we're going to get fired. All I want you to do is trust me. God may not speak audibly, but he will speak clearly. And we have to be in tune with what the Spirit of God is saying to us. And that night, I wasn't some super spiritual moment, but in the stillness of driving down that highway, I heard God say, all I want you to do is trust me. And through study and through leaning on him, depending on him, one time I just tried, I just tried to climb out of the boat. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a person of habit and comfort. Trust me. I've had two jobs since college, FCA, from 98 to 14, and Texas A&M, 14 to now. I'm, I'm one of those guys, I, do, I develop roots, but I got to make sure I don't cross over the line of just getting complacent and too comfortable, but I also need to make sure that I'm not at the point where I'm always unsettled and always looking for the next thing. I got to find my, my spot in him where I know that I'm still trusting and leaning and depending on him, and it's not in my own strength. And so, brothers, I wanted to jump on this morning just to hopefully give you a shot in the arm. Is that too soon with a lot of the vaccines that are going on? Get in mind tomorrow, by the way. Um, but I wanted to come by and encourage you as I have been encouraged, okay? Um, I'm going to get up, and we got staff meeting here in two two hours, and I'm gonna, we're going to be hitting the grind of things, and you're either going to be in an office or you're going to be doing Zooms and things like that. But leave room for God to speak to you. Leave room for God to, to whisper to you of what he wants your marching orders to look like. And the only way that we can do that, one, we're his, and we're united with him as one. And so, um, brothers, I'm honored to jump on with you today. I, I hope... And pray that this word encouraged you. Look, I'll just let you guys know. Look, look at my notes. It's kind of how I operate. There was no, no when an iPad. And when I preach at a church, I may slide through an iPad. But when I'm with you guys, we just get grimy. Okay? We just get back into it. Straight pen to paper. That's how we operate. And that's how we roll. So God bless you all. Thank you so much, uh, man, for letting me join you today. It was truly my honor to be among you. Pray for us, please. Sir? Would you pray for us, please? Absolutely. Father, we love you. <laughs> God, thank you for loving us. We don't deserve it. We're not worthy, but you are, and you make us worthy. Father, I pray that you allow us to be men who would shine bright, Matthew 5, 16, that people would see our good works, but glorify you, God, who's in heaven. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that, God, um, as we break this huddle and say, one, two, three, break, we got the play. And, God, you would allow us, whether it be in the Dallas area, the state of Kansas, wherever it might be, that, God, we would carry out your orders. And, God, um, that we would lean trust 
and depend on you for our next breath and for everything that we are and am. Father, I pray right now that, God, that we would make prayer a high priority. That's the point I want to hit, God, in this prayer, is that, God, we would learn to connect with you. So, Father, I pray that your hand of blessing be upon Coach's outreach. I pray that, God, you be with these men. And this has been literally just an iron sharpening iron moment. We've come together to encourage one another and to give your name the great glory. We love you, God. Anything that is concerning us right now, health issues, family issues, financial issues, anything like that, God, I pray that we would be able to lay them at the foot of the cross and that, God, we would say, we trust you. We trust that you see, you know, and you care, and you will take care of it. And so, Father, we just uh, ask you to go, go before us today. We love you because you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, man. That was outstanding. Amen. And uh, that's the, the best part of our day is going to be these 20 minutes that we were able to spend with you this morning. So, I will tell Lawanda and Galen that I uh, saw you. I'll get yes, word sir. to your parents. And the next, time, next time you're in KC, we're going to go eat. Listen, I'm, listen, I battle this all the time. There's Texas people on here. Oh, Texas barbecue. And look, I get it. But I do miss my burn ins and I miss, um, <laughs> I miss it. I, I made a burger last night and I put my, uh, uh, my Joe's barbecue sauce that my dad sent to me on that burger so yes I, I don't need to pray about it yes the answer is yes <laughs> and, uh, and and i'll say this guys things like this are unbelievable keep it going um every week we're on a